Hi, it's Susanna with Science with Susanna. And today we're going to talk about the brain some more. So we're still working on the central nervous system. We're going to explore the five lobes of the cerebrum and their functions. And then in the next video, I'm gonna talk about the diencephalon, more brain anatomy. Let's go over the four brain regions before we get into the lobes of the cerebrum. So there's of course the cerebrum. These are gonna include the frontal lobes, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, occipital lobes, and insular lobes. And don't worry, I'll show you where all of these are in a moment. Then there's the diencephalon. This means through the middle of the head and it's deep in the heart of the brain. So it includes the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. Then there's the brain stem. And the brain stem includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Last is the cerebellum, which literally means little brain, and uh, that will be the fourth region of the brain. So there's the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. We are going to focus on the cerebrum, though, for the rest of this video. So let's look closely at the cerebrum. You have the frontal lobes, and I have two images here for you. One I drew the superior view of the cerebrum, and then in the other I drew the sagittal view of the cerebrum. The parietal lobes we'll put in blue here, and again, you can see both lobes when you look at the top, but only one when you look at the sagittal view. The temporal lobes you really can only see when you're looking at a sagittal view. The occipital lobes you can see from the top, and then a little bit from the side. And then there's this last lobe, the fifth lobe, called the insular lobes. These are hidden under the temporal lobe. You have to kind of pull with a, a retractor to be able to look at that part of the cerebrum. And in fact, I didn't even teach the insular lobes a while back. I would sort of skirt over it for an entry level class. But as I started to review for this video, I realized, you know what? I'm doing you a disservice if I don't include that one here. So we are gonna talk about it today. Now, before we talk about all of the different parts of the lobes and the general jobs that they have, I need to go over some key brain terminology. The first is the word cortex. When you hear me say the word cortex, I'm talking about this outer beige part that I'm coloring here. And this is the outer layer of the brain and it's where processing of information occurs. It's only like two and a half millimeters thick in most people. But this is where the neuronal cell bodies do all of the thinking, I guess you could say. And it's called gray matter. It's unmyelinated tissue. That's meaning it doesn't have fat wrapped around it to insulate it. But honestly, in the dissections I've seen, even in cadavers, um, it looks more beige than gray and definitely like that in diagrams you'll see in a textbook. So just be aware of that, but we call it gray matter. Now the surface of the brain is all wrinkled, like you can see here in this picture I've drawn. Now, I know this picture looks a little funny. You're like, what is that? It looks like a piece of cauliflower. What it is is a frontal section of the brain. So it's like the brain has been sliced like this. And so you can see there are actually some holes in it that we'll talk about later. They're called ventricles. And the, that surface area is all wrinkly like that with the purpose of increasing the surface area so that you can jam more neurons into the small space, relatively small space. Now, the... Um, the ridges and the hills I'm coloring in red, those are called gyri. So gyrus is singular, gyri is plural. And then the sulcus or the sulci, these are the grooves or the valley and I'm, valleys and I'm gonna do those in green. We'll talk more about gray and white matter later on. So up first, the frontal lobes. So I'm going to color them in the sagittal view, but also I want you to remember that when you look at front, the brain from the top, you can see two of, you can see both of them. The frontal lobes are your problem solving lobes. You have a brain or a math problem, your frontal lobe is working hard. Planning and judgment. So when I say that, I mean thinking about what your, is on your to-do list for the day and deciding whether it's something as wise or not to do. So our personality in large part is um, based in the frontal lobe and particularly in a part of it called the prefrontal cortex, which is at the very front of it. 
Now, a very simp simple thing to remember though for the frontal lobe is it's in charge of controlling your motor output. And in fact, there's a section on there called the precentral gyrus that I'm coloring in red here. And it is your primary motor cortex. So remember cortex, that's the outer layer, does the processing. Primary mean it's the, the indicate, it, it's going to be initiating the, the, and executing the motor movement. And it's in this um, gyrus, meaning a ridge, that is separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Then there's an area called Brokaw's area that is important in initiating, uh, or sorry, forming words, so speech output. That's Brokaw's area, named after the scientist that discovered that when there's damage to it, patients were no longer able to form words like normal. Now the central sulcus, which I'm coloring in green, divides the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes. And that's why the precentral gyrus is called precentral because it's right in front of the central sulcus. Okay, now we'll go to the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes, you can see again, I'm showing you the superior view and then from the side. And they are responsible for processing your sense of touch. And specifically, there are neurons in the post central gyrus that form your somatosensory cortex. And that's how you process your sense of touch from all over your body. Once again, we'll um, go ahead and take a look first at the, I'll label the post central gyrus right here. And then the central sulcus that divides the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So the frontal lobe has the precentral gyrus, the primary motor cortex, and the parietal lobes have the postcentral gyrus, which is the somatosensory cortex or processing sense of, sense of touch. So we're going to separate the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes are also important in tactile object recognition. This is when you know what an object is even without um, seeing it. So like, for example, I have my sunglasses right here. If it were dark out and I felt those, I would be like, oh yeah, those are my sunglasses. And so you have like ability to map the, the geometry of a structure in the parietal lobe. Isn't that cool? It's also responsible for proprioception. This is how you know where your limbs are in space. So what I mean by that is if my eyes are closed, I know that my hand is right here. Or if I move it down, I know it went down. And in fact, even when you're in a pool or something and you go upside down, you always know which way is up, right? If you get spun around enough, it can confuse that proprioception. But what makes it work is your ligaments and your tendons and your muscles, they're all sending sensory signals up to the brain. And that helps your brain know, oh, that muscle is con contracted, so it must be in this position. It's quite complex, right? But also very cool. Now let's move on to the temporal lobes. Now I'm only showing you one view here. The temporal lobes are responsible for processing your sense of hearing. They contain the primary auditory cortex. There's that word again, cortex meaning this is the part of the surface of the brain that processes your sense of hearing. The temporal lobe also has something to do with speech. Remember I told you the frontal lobe helps with speech output? Well, the temporal lobe has an isolated area called Wernicke's area. It's usually lateralized on the left side of your brain. Broca's area usually is also on the left side. When we say lateralization, we mean that there are parts of the cerebrum that um, focus a job more on one side of the cerebrum than the other. It's not as simplistic as we used to think with like left brain, right brain. People want to simplify it, but there definitely is lateralization. And particularly like language is going to be lateralized to the left cerebral hemisphere. Okay, the temporal lobe is also very important in learning, memory, and emotions. That sounds like a lot, right? It's interesting how learning and memory go together, right? We have to remember something in order to be able to say we've learned it. And interestingly, emotions are hugely important in how well you learn something. One of the structures in the temporal lobe that is part of your memory 
is um, called the Hippocampus. And it, it, it got named because they thought it looked like a seahorse. And I guess the Greek for hippocampus is, um, well, it's literally like horse field or horse monster. Sometimes you'll see it translated as sea monster, but it's part of the limbic system. And the limbic system is a phrase we use to describe all the parts of the brain, no matter what lobe they're in or what region of the brain they're in that contribute to your emotional responses. And the hippocampus is a very important one in that. It's also very important in memory, uh, as we've talked about here. So it, it tends to show um, early signs of damage in dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Also related to the emotions is a little almond-shaped structure, structure. Amygdala means almond, and it is part of your fear responses. So very important in how we learn, if we're afraid of something, to stay away from it. For example, I have learned that I'm allergic to fire ant stings, and so you can bet that when I'm walking around the grass here now, I am keeping an eye out for fire ant, ma fire ant mounds. When I was learning about the amygdala many years ago, I heard a story about how experimenters could put electrodes right on the amygdala of a cat, and then the cat would go, Rawr! you know, and they puff all up. And that has stuck with me. So the amygdala is so key for our fear responses. We will talk more about the limbic system later. So the insular lobes, they are um, drawn here in yellow. The, the yellow parts that I put, those are the insular lobes. So you see how they're like hidden? Again, this is a frontal section of the cerebrum. And you wouldn't even notice this part of the cerebrum unless someone like kind of pushed down on one part so you could look in there at it. But I'm including it today because it does seem that it's quite important in processing your sense of taste, what we call the gustatory cor cortex. Now, the parietal lobe is also important in that, and they must communicate with each other to do full processing for your sense of taste. The insular lobes, I think what makes them maybe unique in how they work is that their location touches parts of the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, as well as the temporal lobes. And that central location is making it a hub for coordinating with the other lobes. So because of that, it's going to be um, important in processing emotions, working alongside the temporal lobe and processing sensation, working alongside the parietal lobe, and processing language, working alongside the frontal lobe. So I think of it as like kind of that middleman. The last lobe I'm going to describe are the occipital lobes. Now the occipital lobes are at the back of the brain, and you can see them. There's the superior view, and then there's the sagittal view, and they give you your sense of sight. So they are the location for your primary visual cortex where the processing of vision occurs. So I just want to do one last slide and put it all together, what we've learned about the cerebrum. First of all, there are the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes have uh, quite a lot of different jobs. The prefrontal cortex in particular is important in problem solving, forming your personality, helping you plan and initiate movements. And words to remember there, precentral gyrus contains your primary motor cortex for that job, and speech output in Broca's area. Then there's the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes are important in processing your sense of touch. And they do this with the somatosensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus. They're important for tactile object recognition, and these lobes help to integrate your sense of taste as well as working along with the insular lobe in, to do that processing of your sense of taste. Next up, temporal lobes. Now the temporal lobes process your sense of hearing and they do this through the auditory cortex. The temporal lobe is famous for its role in memory and emotions, particularly because it contains the hippocampus as well as the amygdala, which is important in fear responses. Speech comprehension is located um, in a lateralized part of the temporal lobe called Wernicke's area. Now let's move on to the insular lobes. He, these are hidden deep in a fold. I think that's how they got their name. They're insulated from the rest of the cortex of the brain hidden inside. 
These process your sense of taste and interact with, interact with the other brain centers for helping them out with a variety of things like language, sensation, and emotions. Then the occipital lobes, last but not least, the occipital lobes process your sense of vision and they do this through a structure called the visual cortex. So we made it through the cerebrum. We talked about the four regions of the brain and then we focused in on the cerebrum and the lobes of the cerebrum. So my goal is that in the next video, we're gonna do more brain anatomy. I'm definitely going to explain the diencephalon, that's things like your hypothalamus, and time permitting, I'll also talk about the midbrain and um, the rest of the brain stem. So we'll see how far we get in that one. But next video, more brain anatomy. Thanks for joining me. I'm Susanna with Science with Susanna, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.